All right, let's go ahead and kick this off. Thank you very much for coming to uh, today's session on Rubin and satellite constellations. Now begins the exciting part where I attempt to share my screen. Okay, um, I, am, I am Meredith Rawls. I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington. Uh, also uh, work primarily for Rubin Observatory in the data management team and starting to transition a little bit towards operations with uh, verification and validation adventures. Um, so that's kind of my context here. As a reminder, uh, you've seen this a million times so far if you've been attending other sessions this week, uh, please remember that there is a code of conduct and we take it seriously. And this is being recorded as you acknowledged when you entered the session. Uh, we're going to be doing questions based in Slack, so I'm not going to stop you from posting in the Zoom chat, but I'm also not going to really look at it. Um, so that is pretty standard. Here's the outline for our session today. Um, I'll introduce each speaker really briefly as they get started, but I want to see if we can save the full 20 minutes at the end for um, Q&A and discussion uh, amongst everybody here. So I don't want to, to spend too long on uh, the transitions and please save your questions. Um, for the end, but you can type them in Slack as you go, and then we'll get to as many as we can. So without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Tony Tyson, who is a uh, professor at uh, UC Davis and a driving force behind the entire uh, Rubin project. Take it away, Tony. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, good to be with you today. Um, just gonna outline some of the challenges that we've had along the line uh, with regard to these satellites. Um, because of the large field of view of the uh, Rubin Observatory, uh, the, 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 the camera itself uh, will encounter uh, many bright uh, low Earth orbiting satellite trails uh, between one and two per exposure, generally speaking, uh, during the survey. Um, and there are some imaging artifacts uh, due to the nonlinear response of the charge coupled devices uh, that are difficult to remove. Um, and so when uh, I reached out to uh, SpaceX, uh, which as you know, um, has been the primary launch outfit so far, um, they wanted to know a number, just one number from us. And that was how faint should we try to make our satellites? So we went into the lab um, and uh, uh, with Andrew Bradshaw and others and, and, and uh, um, uh, Daniel Pollan, Craig Lage, and we, we imaged a, a slit onto a LSST uh, CCD, which I'll describe very briefly. Um, Andrew will do a better job uh, in his presentation and uh, measured, the, measured the response. Um, and uh, because of the fact that it was not linear, uh, we were able to come up with a number uh, for SpaceX, which is about seventh magnitude or so. Uh, of course, as you know, that's been difficult for them to, for anybody to reach with these huge satellites that are many meters in size. So even if you uh, can take care of that challenge, um, you're still left with the trail itself. In other words, if you can somehow remove the crosstalk through some clever image processing in the image, uh, in, in the uh, instrument signature removal stage of processing the images, you're still left with the trail, and then um, we'll hear later from Claire with regard to masking the trail, and we've been doing some tests on that. Uh, but um, there's still some systematics left over, and it's uh, up to the community to decide whether they can live with them. So we all know that the LSSC science will in fact be limited by systematics because it's such a huge survey that the statistical um, effects are so small by comparison we won't actually know what unexpected discoveries we missed if we have these um, residuals from the satellite trail. So next slide, please. Uh, this is a image of one of the original Starlinks. Actually, uh, they look a little different now, but uh, pretty much the same. That's about three meters across and 10 meters high. Uh, so it's big and it reflects sunlight. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is something that you probably have seen. This was a single, uh, I think it was 150 second exposure uh, by Alex Dierlicke Wagner um, in his program at, uh, on the Blanco telescope, um, which uh, intercepted uh, a launch of 60 um, 
Starlink satellites, and 19 of them uh, came through the uh, that cam image, um, and it's fairly bright, of course. This is the problem we're going to be uh, dealing with. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with regard to the Lubin, uh, Rubin Observatory, um, there's a satellite trail that will appear uh, across our field of view there on the left. Uh, as you know, this the CCDs are laid out in uh, 189 of them in, in, in that configuration, and they come in uh, a ra so-called rafts of three by three CCDs with the electronics um, uh, there uh, on the right. And uh, and the question is uh, how to deal with it. Uh, next slide, please. The CCDs, as you saw there in the previous one, are split up into 16 separate segments, each of which has its own output amplifier. And the reason we do this is because we want to read out the entire focal plane, 3.2 gigapixels, in only two seconds. And so we have to do it in parallel. The problem is that these output channels cross talk with one another. So video channels are screaming at video rates, and the lines are very close. And there's some crosstalk. There are, in principle, about 200 channels involved here, if you do the math. Uh, but in, in practice, we found that uh, at least 50 um, crosstalk coefficients must be uh, measured. And there are 189 of these puppies. So you have to multiply times 189. Next slide. Uh, this is a uh, picture of what we saw when we illuminated one of the production LSSD CAM CCDs in our system. Uh, and you see the main trail there and the, uh, really bright. Uh, and then you see the crosstalk. Uh, due to these channel-channel uh, uh, video crosstalks. Um, and uh, it's not linear, that's the problem. If it were linear, then we could just measure the coefficients and go home. Next slide. So this is what we have found recently. So crosstalk comes from a number of different places. It can come from uh, capacitive coupling between lines and cables. It can come from the electronics itself. Nothing is perfect. And it can come from the charge coupled device on chip. So what we've been doing in the last year is to try to isolate where it's coming from. We've, dis we've discovered that, um, that uh, the electronics does have crosstalk. Um, and however, it's about a factor of five or so less than the charge coupled device uh, and the cabling. So this, what I'm showing you um, on the, X axis in these plots, uh, I'm showing you some crosstalk um, uh, between segments. And each color is a separate crosstalk between one segment and the next nearest neighbor segment, one amplifier to the nearest neighbor amplifier each way. And this is just a few of the many. And you can see that uh, they're not straight lines. If it was a horizontal straight line, in each case, the crosstalk would be linear. So the x-axis is the signal strength um, injected um, signal from the uh, projector in electrons per pixel, which are my favorite unit because that's what we have to worry about in the camera. And you can see it goes all the way up to saturation and we have some nonlinearities, which as you can see are as big as about 50% in some cases. So you say to yourself, okay, fine. You just have to measure all this. Um, you have to measure, uh, uh, say, for example, if you want to, if you want to, if you believe these functions in the re reproducible, you might have four coefficients for a, a, a polynomial fit. Multiply that times 50, and then uh, there are uh, uh, you want to do it at about 20 to 40 at different intensity levels in order to measure it. Then you multiply all that times 189 for the number of TCDs, and you get about well uh, 3,800 crosstalk coefficients. Uh, which is about one and a half million measurements. And you have to do these measurements to the adequate precision so that you know that you can subtract the crosstalk down to the level where it doesn't affect your science. And you have to update this continuously during observations. Next slide. So armed with this, um, next slide, please. Um, armed with this um, seventh magnitude uh, requirement and uh, how faint we can go, we came up with this plot uh, Bojin came up with this plot, which is a full forward simulation of the effects of the entire system. No se sé, veo esta, esta y hay otra que vale 75, pero digamos esa no sé si sea chiquita, grande. Please, please get a um, meeting. So I'm getting, mm -hmm. speaking of crosstalk. <laughs> um, 
the y-axis is uh, peak pixel counts in electrons, and um, 10 to the 5 is uh, saturation. No, I mean and the x-axis is uh, the satellite apparent magnitude, if you were to measure it. And you can see most of the x-axis you can see with your own eyes without a telescope. Uh, but um, what happens there is that those gray areas that you see at the bottom, those are the areas where we think we can, if, if uh, we get the satellite faint enough, that if the crosstalk is less than about 10 to the four electrons, um, uh, it, that is to say, if the satellite signal is less than about 10 to the four electrons in whatever exposure we have, which is about 15 seconds, you can see that um, uh, we can maybe correct the crosstalk. The upper lighter gray area is if we um, have 5% uh, accuracy and the lower area is if we um, come up with only 10% accuracy. Um, over all these millions of measurements. Uh, so next slides, please. Um, if we were to attempt to, um, if we were attempt to vo avoid these satellites, uh, then uh, Peter Yoakum came up with this scary forward simulation of only 10 minutes of observing where you see there's no place to hide in the sky. And this is a very inefficient process if you have something like our rapid cadence. And so we can't really avoid uh, 40,000 satellites, um, and there are going to be many more than that. Next slide, please, uh, shows the um, distribution of satellites in altitude um, and the um, most, most recent additions from SpaceX there at 550 kilometers altitude. There are a number of things you worry about when you look at something like this, and one of them certainly is possible collisions of satellites. And uh, I don't have time right now, maybe in questions, to, to deal with that, but that's an issue. Uh, but you can see that things are changing as a function of time, um, and we're aimed towards about 100 to 200,000 satellites in orbit. Uh, next slide, please. So the problem is if you um, have satellites that can be seen all night long, of course, and that will happen if you have your satellite up uh, above about 600 kilometers. And so the plot on the left from Pat Seitzer um, plots the number of satellites um, in, in a uh, in, a, in, a, in a simulation where um, uh, 10,000 satellites were put at uh, 1,000 kilometers, um, and you can, see the, you can see them basically all night long, uh, which is bad news uh, in the summer season. And then um, if you put them below um, 600 kilometers, say 500 kilometers, uh, you can see them really only in twilight, which is, which is better, of course. Uh, so uh, we don't want to have uh, satellites at six at at, uh, um, at at 1200. And unfortunately, one of the uh, uh, one of the companies has their satellites at 1200. Next slide, please. You're about out of time, Tony. Okay, thanks. Um, so SpaceX has been working with the community. Um, they have been trying very very hard to uh, dim their satellites. A number of different experiments are going on. They're continuing. The technology is moving, the satellites are evolving, all these companies are building bigger and better satellites, and they're getting brighter and brighter. Uh, but we're working with SpaceX to measure the effects of all these darkening uh, tests on the satellites. But as I mentioned, however, even if all that works, uh, one is uh, left with the main trail and the effects of that. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of how faint uh, SpaceX has been able to go. Uh, this is about a one magnitude improvement little more than that, um, over the original Starlink uh, 0.9s. Uh, and one particular uh, invocation of a mitigation, um, a sunshade basically uh, on one satellite shows that they're down um, almost to the acceptable brightness. But things are changing, as I mentioned, and uh, um, the story isn't over. Next slide, please. And so with tens of thousands of these, uh, generally no combination of mitigations can completely avoid the impacts on um, of satellite trails in our science with LSST. Um, we're designed to look at um, strange new things at very low signal to noise level and very, very faint. Um, and uh, of course, this would naively require fewer and fainter satellites, which isn't going to happen. And there's a link to a paper um, that we all had um, last year. And finally, my last slide just outlines the sort of Wild West flavor of this scramble um, of all of these companies that have billions, actually tens of billions of dollars of investors chasing 
new opportunities in low Earth orbit. Uh, and with, in the absence of um, international regulations on relevant timescales, uh, satellite operators are exponentially exploiting the near-Earth environment with impunity. Um, but it turns out that uh, our observatory's discovery potential is also its vulnerability to LEOSATs. So while SpaceX is uh, attempting to lessen the impact on astronomy through a number of different mitigations, there's no real sign yet, in my view, that other operators will do so. They've come to the table during our last meeting, but um, you know they've got a bigger fish to fry. And if you want to find out about those bigger fish, tune in to that link that I have there at the bottom. Okay, that's it. Thanks. I have some things to, uh, to present uh, in questions. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, yeah, excellent overview, kind of setting the stage for the reality we find ourselves in. Um, uh, as a reminder, please uh, go to the Slack and upvote or ask questions. Uh, we won't have time for them all. There are already several. So please, uh, thumbs up the ones you'd like us to, to get to the top priority ones. Uh, next, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Rachel Street, who is a project scientist at Las Cruces Observatory and a key part of the uh, Transit and Variable Stars Science Collaboration. Please take it away, Rachel. Thank you. So hello, everyone. I would like to give a brief update on the, the recent workshop regarding satellite constellations and their impact on astronomy and on society in general. Uh, SATCON 2 took place on the, under the aegis of the AAS, the NSF and Noir Lab, and it was designed to further work of a, a similar workshop that took place last year. Next slide, please. Thanks. SATCOM 1 recommended a number of studies that should be undertaken to better understand the impacts of satellite constellations, as well as the various mitigation efforts that need to be explored. So one of the goals of SATCOM 2 has been to take these recommendations and specify them more precisely into particular work packages. The workshop also aims to solicit input from a much broader range of stakeholders and contributors and to provide a forum for discussion with the satellite operators. The next slide, please. In the run-up to the workshop, there were four working groups that were created to study and to define the recommendations in more detail. These fell into the categories of observations, algorithms, community engagement and policy. So I'd like to give a quick uh, overview of each of these in turns. The working groups were tasked to produce a written report of their findings and present that at the workshop for further discussion. Next slide. To start with the observations working group, it was their job to define the observations necessary to characterize the impact of satellite constellations and the resources necessary to achieve that, but also to specify what information the community needs from the satellite office in order to mitigate their impact. Next slide. The group's most significant takeaway is that no combination of strategies can fully mitigate the impacts of these satellites on astronomy. This is something that at some level all astronomers will have to learn to adapt to. They noted that more information is needed from the satellite operators, uh, particularly regarding their radio transmissions, as the protected bands are already impinged on uh, for science observations. Operators are also asked to provide better information on the satellite orbits and to more frequently update this information, uh, which would allow us to better um, project the satellite's likely positions uh, for scheduling purposes. Next slide. Uh, sorry, I think I'm a slide behind. Oh, did I get... The observations group is what you're on or uh, No, actually, I will speak to this slide one second, sorry. Uh, I can go back if I missed one. No, you're fine, thank you. <laughs> um, they recommended the uh, establishment of a resource hub where everybody can in access information about the constellations, as well as tools to mitigate their impacts. And at this point, I will go on to the next slide, please. Uh, okay, I'm not sure quite what happened there, but I, not to worry. Um, 
They stress the impact, the importance of including a database of uh, satellite impacted observations, which will uh, provide feedback for the satellite operators to help them understand uh, the impacts, as well as the effects of any engineering changes that they make, which will then allow them to reduce their impact. The workshop highlighted the need for a service which provides access to satellite positional information in an ephemeris format that would be familiar to most astronomers. Um, although spacetrack.org currently provides this service, it's done on a voluntary basis, so it's strongly recommended that this be fully funded and made on a sustainable footing. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I think I synced up with you. I think you have a small delay and then we're good now. Uh, sorry for any delays at my end. So moving on to the algorithms uh, workflow, they were tasked to specify three software packages, one which would identify and mask satellite trails and images, one to assist with observation planning, and also a data simulation that will help us predict the impact of trails on different types of data. Uh, next slide, please. In each case, the group has defined the functionality required from those packages and also reviewed the utility of any currently available software packages um, if those exist publicly. In the process of that, um, there were a few important takeaways that I wanted to mention. Uh, the first of which is no algorithm can fully save all of the affected data. Uh, we're not talking about saving data, we're talking about salvaging it wherever possible. Our ability to plan observations to avoid satellites is limited, um, especially in the absence of better information from the operators. Uh, we wanted to stress the importance of providing ephemerides as a service, uh, rather than expect everybody to recreat the same calculations and the group strongly endorsed the sat hub concept uh, put forward by the observation groups. And spectroscopic observations are likely to be particularly severely impacted. And it was felt that the only real way to mitigate this will be to have simultaneous imaging observations for every ground-based spectrograph. Uh, next slide, please. The community engagement group in get invited contributions from a wide range of stakeholders, including First Nation and indigenous communities, educators and ecologists. I found this to be a very thought provoking dialogue and I really hope it continues. Um, I wouldn't dream of uh, being able to summarize everybody's points of views, but I found it underscored that there are many perspectives and priorities coming from people, even within the same communities. And it's very important that everybody be able to bring that to the table. Next slide, please. So rather than attempting to represent all possible perspectives that were presented, I would touch on just a few um, takeaway points that were, I felt were particularly important. It was stressed that there was a strong importance to fostering a sense of having a human a connection with the stars that was emphasized very strongly by several speakers as that can lead to an increased sense of stewardship. The role of planetaria was also um, emphasized in really bringing home the impact of satellites to everybody. Um, but it was noted that the productions for these uh, facilities also take a lot of funding and effort to produce them and to staff the shows. And it was stressed that it's important to avoid doom and gloom attitudes in public outreach. Uh, it's better to present a more positive visions of how things could be as this is more impactful. Next slide please. The policy working group had the challenge of considering both the US and international legal and political situations. Uh, within the US, they recommended that the impacts on astronomy should be considered before licenses to launch are given to operators. Next slide, please. Internationally, the situation is a bit more complex and the main legal context is the Outer Space Treaty. This has some applicable items, such as the restrictions that uh, so-called actors cannot impinge on the freedoms of other actors in space, and it references constraints on anything which has a harmful impact on the activity of any other actors. But the interpretation of these clauses has yet to be tested with respect to satellite constellations. There's also no mechanism for evaluating the ongoing impacts. 
Uh, next slide, please. So with the caveat that I am not a lawyer, uh, we had, I personally had the following takeaways from that discussion. The first is that there is an urgent need to update space policies around the world and to have discussions in international forum. To that end, I'd like to give a shout out to Connie Walker and the recent UN report on uh, dark and quiet skies. That's a continuing effort that she is leading. The polluter pays model also uh, received a lot of attention during the workshop and a lot of discussion. And a lot of people supported the idea that operators should cover the cost of mitigation efforts. But there were some warnings that this could lead them to having the attitude of simply paying a fine and moving on rather than actively participating in reducing their impact. And it was pointed out that engagement needs to take place across all levels of government to be most effective. And last slide, please. So to wrap up, the working groups are now finalizing the report from SATCOM 2, which will be shared with the relevant government agencies. And if you are interested to learn more, I encourage you to check out the workshops, uh, the websites are given below. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rachel. You covered an entire weeks of conference in uh, an astounding 10 minutes. So I, I sincerely appreciate uh, you doing that for everyone who wasn't able to be there. Um, I recognize that we're a little bit behind time. I'm going to respect um, all the come upcoming speakers getting their full. Um, everyone from here on out has five minutes. So I'm going to ask them to please stick to that as best as they're able. Um, so without further ado, um, just a reminder to continue adding your questions and discussions to the Slack. There are many there. It's going to be great. Um, <laughs> wait, I thought that, wait, hang on. Did the order get messed up here? I thought that Jasmine was next. Yeah, I'm in the next. That's odd. Oh, Andrew added a bonus slide in the wrong place. That's fine. <laughs> We're all figuring this out. <laughs> I like that, Andrew. That was a good interlude, interrupting the flow with a satellite. That was nice. Um, so I, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Jasmine Watt, who is an undergraduate at University of Washington, has, has been working with myself um, and a graduate student, um, Dina Bekezovic, over the course of the summer um, on a project that she's going to tell us about now. Jasmine. Right. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine, and I'm working with Mira Desrolls, who is chairing this session, and Dino Bleswick, a grad student at UW, as she mentioned. Um, so uh, I'm working on Project Trailblazer. Uh, so Trailblazer is an uh, open data repository for astronomical observations affected by um, satellite strikes, as you can see in these two images in the very beginning of this session. Um, so today, um, in my presentation, I'm going to talk about why we want Trailblazer, um, how it works, and our current progress. So uh, next slide, please. So the main reason that we want to work on Trailblazer is that um, we know now nowadays that many satellites are working uh, on the sky and they're very bright and basically just randomly go in your uh, observations. So um, and as we as we know that it's very hard to dodge or inefficient to inefficient to dodge uh, this impact. So the Trailblazer basically um, just collects those um, affected images and then uh, make them available for people to study the impact. Um, uh, yeah. And so, so important. One important thing for Trailblazer is that it's dynamic. Um, it's kind. It's basically a dynamic the database because uh, the satellite population changes very fast. For instance, its brightness and the distribution changes over time. So we do want to uh, take uh, people's upload. Uh, uh, yeah, keep it up to date. So the first thing you can see the first feature is uh, basically we take an upload and store the images and then make them queryable. And the second of the important thing for Trailblazer is that it's an uh, open and setable uh, database. Basically, for instance, today I found an interesting image for uh, that I want to study and I want to share with my study group. And then basically uh, I can just cite, cite that from Trailblazer easily. Uh, the last one, we will talk more about uh, standardized metadata in a query tool, but basically it's just uh, Trailblazer will take the important uh, met, uh, fits headers um, and then store it in our, our cloud. Next slide, please. Right. Um, so with Trailblazer, we uh, we mentioned in the previous two slides that we uh, it's a place that we collect these uh, images with tricks and then uh, provide them uh, provide, uh, offer people a place to study the brightness and distribution etc of satellites um, 
the change of the satellites over time. And then uh, basically we hope Trailblazer can reduce the impact on service like a Rubens LS ST. Um, so what we, make, we use to make Trailblazer is uh, Python plus Django. Django is a Python framework. So yeah, um, we will, Django uh, has a feature that we can basically test, uh, like do a local offline test uh, for the website before we launch it. Okay, next slide, please. Right, so uh, so far uh, our progress is we made to upload and query pages. Uh, you can see uh, like basically they just look like any other uh, upload and query pages. But um, the special thing here is that when you upload uh, FITS files and it just uh, take the fit, uh, FITS file and and uh, store it in a cloud that we um, we'll use it. We will uh, set up in the future. You don't bas you don't really need to uh, fill out any other extra forms uh, for users. Um, so so this makes it uh, make it easier for query pages to filter and search the metadata uh, and then figure out what uh, images you like. So um, yeah, metadata. Uh, sorry, query page is uh, mainly the part I'm working with. So next slide, please. So uh, what's behind the um, query tool is that basically, first of all, we <laughs> make a interface. You can see we put multiple fields here. And then the first one is a drag and tag with multiple options uh, that we can select instrument. For instance, uh, we will show like, for instance, I uh, select that can, I will show the results later. Um, so the second thing is that you can see here, we uh, use the, our input, our query uh, conditions to, to uh, retrieve the images from metadata. So here we use the metadata filter. And then the last step, of course, is to display uh, the results. So it's just purely a um, HTML code. Um, so uh, how, do, how we uh, design these fields is based on the WCS information uh, that uh, is processed by our uh, upload tools. Yes. And then next, next please. So um, when we uh, require a uh, uh, Deccan images, like for, for instance, I just put Deccan, that I want all images taken by Deccan. And then you can see that's uh, all the results we have now. And uh, it's just a small testing uh, database now for now, but in the future, we, of course, we'll um, uh, make it public and then people can upload and then we can uh, just filter out um, images that groups want to study. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, it's it, it, so, uh, in short, Trailblazer is um, basically it collects fit images with satellite uh, strikes and all the impacts in it and make it available and easy to access for people to study with. And um, our current progress, to, we made a offsite test uh, on upload and query pages. We plan to launch this at the end of this year and we look forward, your, uh, forward to your opinions and suggestions. And yeah, please post it as like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you, Mirti. All right, also excellent job keeping it to five minutes. Uh, oh, so that's where Andrew's cool thing is supposed to go. Uh, well, pretend that this is the part where Andrew sort of bombs <laughs> on into the presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, you right, reload, this, uh, well, reload yeah. the slides. Oh, All go right. ahead, sorry. <laughs> well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll just do it. No, it's fine. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's important for the effect. <laughs> All right. There you go. There you go. Uh, so my yeah. pleasure to introduce Andrew Bradshaw, who works with the uh, Ruben camera team at, at Slack. Take it away. Hi, thanks. Uh, so yeah, uh, I swear I didn't put that original interruption in, on purpose, but I added another one just for fun now. And uh, so yeah, this uh, what I'll be presenting on behalf of the camera team is the result of uh, tons of work. Uh, starting uh, just actually a couple days after the first Starlink satellites were launched, we became very concerned with all of these reports of how bright they were and how bright they probably would be. And uh, so we went to studying them in the lab, as Tony uh, mentioned earlier. And so um, let's go back one page, is it possible? To the facts. There we go. Uh, there's, I think. That's all that's there. Can we go forward? Uh, maybe. It's a bit mixed up. There's a camera back. Let's go back to. Oh, oh it's, oh, it's, oh, I see what happened. <laughs> dirt, 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 dirt. <laughs> <laughs> totally understandable. These dang Google starlings messing up everything. 
All right, that's what I okay. want. Okay, <laughs> yeah, this is what I want. So yeah, as Tony mentioned, uh, we, we were immediately concerned with this and immediately started studying it in the lab as best as we could. And uh, as we have now learned, and as Tony also highlighted, here's some facts, so we're all on the same page. So just for uh, the Starlinks, I'm presenting some facts on the left. There's gonna be about 10,000 of them at 550 kilometers and perhaps more at different orbits. Um, and so each of these will be currently around seventh magnitude, maybe a little brighter or maybe a little dimmer, but currently it doesn't look like it's gonna get much better or much worse. Uh, they'll be out of focus because we you know we're focused on the universe and they're so close, uh, but they'll be moving at about half a degree per second. Even higher orbits, they'll be slower uh, relatively, but they'll also be brighter and all night, so that's not good. Uh, and in a 15 second exposure, the pixel brightness would be the equivalent of a 16th magnitude star, just like all across the focal plane uh, in that line. Uh, so the resultant uh, kind of camera detail that's important is there's about 10,000 electrons in each peak pixel, and that's about 10% of the saturation of our detectors and uh, about ten, about a thousand times our detector read noise. And uh, the, so the scattered light, which you can see on the right in this figure, this is taken from a hyper supreme cam image where a satellite flew through, uh, showing kind of the effects of a satellite uh, stacking up the whole profile. Uh, the, the scattered light will probably extend 30 or 60 arc seconds away or just about hundred pixels of uh, data will be kind of immeasurably uh, affected. So without serious darkening, most satellites will be thousands or millions or hundreds of millions of times brighter than the faintest objects we'll be seeing. So that's a big problem. We should probably look uh, for ways to solve that. So next slide. So yeah, so that's not just it. It's not just the main streak as Tony hinted at before. There's this horrible crosstalk problem, which you know we needed to solve anyways because stars will crosstalk. But now this crosstalk is imprinting a very correlated linear signal on all of our images and we need to get rid of it so it doesn't affect our correlations of other things. Uh, so yeah, you can see the multiple orders of crosstalk that we have observed on LSST CCDs with LSST electronics. Uh, there are studies about the nonlinearity of that crosstalk with brightness. If this is uh, confirmed on full focal plane operation and, and all of that, then it will need some next level instrument signature removal to measure it and uh, first and then correct it. But uh, there have been studies by uh, our team that indicate that the background estimation is also critical for this. So the blue line on the bottom left plot shows the kind of default data management uh, approach to measuring these crosstalk coefficients and uh, fixing the kind of background subtraction error. You can get a flattened crosstalk profile, so that's better. But we really need to study this a lot more because uh, there's also going to be a lot of unknown unknowns that we won't notice until we fix everything else. So, uh, so given this like crosstalk effect, just at base level, every pixel that a satellite crosses will need a tenfold number of pixel corrections uh, to get, get it mitigated to read noise level. So next slide, please. So uh, one of our methods for studying this in the laboratory is to use this slit projector. So on the left, you see a little photographic slit, the same way that our CCDs are made. We can make little slits for light to pass through, and we can put that on optics and shine it on the focal plane. And uh, so we can get very kind of deep results by taking these images hundreds, you know, thousands of times. And uh, indeed, we're planning these kinds of studies for the full focal plane. Uh, these are expected to result in about one part in a million precision. Uh, so we should be able to nail a lot of these effects down with the data we're going to gather. And there's a bunch of other ways that we could put slits on the focal plane, uh, you know, simulates satellite streaks. And um, so some of those are listed below. Some of them we'll pursue and others we may just kind of suggest. But uh, next slide, please. So uh, some of the mitigation strategies that we can employ, uh, these are all about detecting the crosstalk or detecting the effect, uh, studying it, uh, physically modeling it, and then minimizing, if we can, through 
operation of the camera. Uh, one of the things that we've already studied is the ASPIC, this on-chip pix, on pro pixel processing chip that uh, has, you know, if you just change the gain or RC constant of this little device on the LSST electronics, you get a much different crosstalk pattern and also can remove some other uh, worrying effects. So we've, we've begun studies like that and they're ongoing. Uh, one thing that we noticed and you can see on the right hand figure is that reading out slower also of course reduces the crosstalk. It's all about the kind of throughput of the data the pixel data and uh but that would mean slower surveying and that's probably worse than starlinks so we'll have to study that but uh, a single source what we've realized is probably a single source can't explain all the crosstalk that we've seen just these aspect measurements compared to image measurements shown in the bottom figures uh, we see some uh, similar signals and so that might be hinting at uh, kind of a, a multiple source regime that will uh, end up having to entangle, uh, disentangle to uh, truly solve. Next slide, please. So uh, finally, uh, correction strategies. I think that'll be covered by uh, Claire uh, next, but uh, in general, it's just about gathering more data uh, in different ways. And of course, we also want to help the world solve the root problem whether that is darkening satellites or tracking satellites so we know where they are or um, uh, sharing our mitigation strategies and things like that. We want to help the world solve this problem. But uh, specifically for the LSST, our current method is all about just taking all this data on the left. This is raw data with streaks projected onto the data. And you can see all these crosstalk, this horrible ash pattern that uh, is produced. And uh, so we, we, we did through that cross that uh, streak across the CCDs, and we can measure the crosstalk on all of these amplifier pairs and across multiple CCDs, and kind of distill this down to just these uh, the central uh, crosstalk coefficient matrix. And if you apply that to every pixel of every image, which is a huge task, I mean it's a it's an addition additional uh, large effort. Um, you get the thing on the right, which of course isn't perfect. If you look at it too long, it uh, you could see all the flaws, and some of them were induced by the correction method being imperfect. So we have to be careful about that. But uh, in general, the method I think has promise, and we'll be able to, with the help of this amazing team that we've got assembled, uh, solve this problem for the LSST to whatever precision we desire. And so, um, yeah, we'll we'll have a lot of deeper studies soon, plus electronic testing, but. Uh, in general, I think the only long-term solution that we should all focus on is this worldwide academic and industry and public collaboration, which is just now beginning. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. That's a, quite the animation at the end there. Um, all right, we have 15 minutes left in the session and two more speakers. So uh, at, at this stage, probably most of the Q&A is going to happen via Slack threads. Um, so feel free to to scroll through and chime in uh, now or or following the session. Um, we'll see if we can get to one or two questions at the end of it. Um, but without further ado, um, let me introduce my colleague um, Claire Saunders, who is a member of the uh, Ruben Data Management Team uh, based in Princeton, is going to tell us a little bit about some of the algorithmic work going on for Street Global. Claire, hey, thank you, Meredith. I will try to be speedy. Um, so I'm going to cover what. Uh, the Rubin data management team is doing right now um, to deal with streaks in our data. Um, so in the image I'm showing here, this is a coad, so it's a stack of uh, images that were taken covering the same patch of the sky. Um, and you can see that um, there are a couple of ghosts in the picture in the image, and there's also this pretty clear satellite streak going through the top, um, the top of the image. Um, so the uh, data reduction um, pipeline had already incorporated some uh, uh, some artifact rejection, and this deals with a lot of things like cosmic rays, and it did take out quite a few of the um, satellite trails, but um, it wasn't perfect, uh, especially in cases where like a satellite trail is um, overlapping a bright star. So we wanted something that would hopefully be a little bit more foolproof for identifying these. Okay, so next slide. Um, okay, uh, sorry, um, one back. 
Okay. All right. So um, what we've done is added this streak masking procedure in um, the coedition process of the data release production. So as we saw in the last image, these streaks are very easily identifiable by eye um, to find them automatically. We're using an algorithm that just detects straight lines. Um, so a half transform is sort of the conventional approach for doing this, um, but it is fairly slow and it can be a little bit noisy. So to have improved speed and accuracy, we use something called the kernel-based half transform, um, which was proposed by Fernandez and Oliveira um, back in 2008. And that's what we have implemented in the DRP pipeline. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is just a quick um, example of how this sort of procedure works. Um, you start starting with an image like um, the top left image here of the chessboard. Um, you use a canny edge detector, which uh, just pulls out all of the edges in the image. And then once you have this um, sort of black and white edge image, then you can run something that would detect straight lines. So the image um, C, the bottom left, is showing the results with just a conventional Huff um, transform um, line detection. And then the image on the bottom right is showing the kernel based one, which is basically getting a little bit of cleaner results, um, fewer, um, fewer multiple detections for each line. And it, like I said, it runs faster. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, so um, how do we actually implement this in the pipeline? So first to note on how we do the image processing. Uh, when we're talking about these co-ads, we split the field of view into patches, um, which are subregions about of about a degree and a half on the side. And uh, they're constructed by taking all of the exposures that overlap with that patch um, warped onto the tangent plane. Um, so to actually detect artifacts, what we do is we take a very uh, like aggressively clipped coad and then subtract that from each of the individual um, exposures that overlap with that patch. So this uh, difference image is what we actually use for detecting artifacts. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the image on the left here is just an example of one of these difference images. This is one you can see there's really obviously um, a satellite streak going through the image. So what we've done here is first just taking the detection map. So basically anything that um, is above a certain uh, threshold for signal to noise. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so now we're running the canny edge detection on our uh, detection map. And what you can see from here is that this uh, streak that was going across the image has now become two approximately straight lines. Okay, so this is where we're going to run the, um, the Huff transform arm. Okay, and next slide, please. Okay, so now we run this Huff transform nicely detect the two edges of the streak and then kind of assuming that if you have a cluster of um, detected lines, those are the edges of a streak. So we say, okay, we have this very likely line that's the average of um, a cluster of detected lines. Next slide, please. Okay, so once we have this um, likely uh, streak detection, we go back to the original image and now this um, figure is showing uh, just the streak in profile where you're looking, uh, the x-axis is, is showing the perpendicular distance um, from the axis of the streak. Um, and the blue points are showing you the data. And then we're just fitting a very rough um, two-dimensional uh, model to this. So we're not really trying to get the exact um, behavior of the satellite streak, like whether it has modulations and brightness along the line. We just want something very rough um, and that's going to basically capture where uh, the streak is in the image on average. Um, next slide. Okay, and then what we have opted to do is just mask out anywhere in the image where our model is above some minimum detection threshold. 
Um, so currently we're setting this as just the same uh, threshold that we used for making detections in general in the image. Um, if uh, some people like Tony or uh, Tony's team or Andrew Bradshaw said, you really need to go down to a lower threshold, we can certainly do that to mask out more of the um, satellite from the image. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is just going back to our original image. Anywhere where we saw that that satellite trail is above uh, a certain threshold, we're just going to set that um, to, well, we'll set the weights to zero for that point in that area that will be masked out of any future use of the, the image. Okay, next slide. Okay, so then this is just going back to that first example that I showed at the beginning, running this procedure on um, through our uh, pipeline for producing co-edited images, um, we've removed this uh, satellite streak. Um, and so this is fully implemented in the current um, DRP pipeline that, uh, Dan, that the DM team um, is working on. And we're looking at using this for the, um, the prompt processing as well in the future. Okay, so thank you and looking forward to questions. Thank you so much, Claire. It's exciting that we're, uh, we're starting to come up with actual ways to deal with these. All right, um, the final speaker uh, for this session is uh, Michelle Bannister, who's an astronomer at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, and is going to tell us a little bit about some of the broader picture concerns uh, for a future with lots of satellite constellations. Uh, and I know we're low on time, but Michelle, take your five minutes and we're just going to have a Slack-based Q&A, so. Okay. Uh, Kia ora folks. So, so I've been asked to speak a little bit more about the broader impacts and uh, it, community engagement and community impacts that we have here. And I thought it's useful to identify in the context of this mega constellation conversation, who we mean by community, because uh, um, the level to which, uh, um, sorry, Meredith, this is me swiping. <laughs> um, the, the level to which we often talk about community in the context of this workshop is our science collaborations and our broader Rubin Observatory community, right? But for engagement with the issues around this, community is very much, you know, your neighbors as much as uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, people that you have in your research institutions through to your uh, broader, you know, people whom you live with. And in the broader context of trying to think about uh, the communities beyond just your urban colleagues or your rural colleagues, uh, um, the uh, um, indigenous communities in your uh, in the various nations that we're in, the nations that we're part of. We also have sufficient other communities that we need to think about in the context of this problem. We have our industry colleagues in aerospace, the engineers who are designing and creating these constellations. We have our media colleagues who are engaged in communicating to the public the scope of this issue and our progress in having these discussions and, find, and coming up with the kind of technical um, potential uh, characterizations that we've been talking about earlier. And we also have uh, um, the uh, policy colleagues who are the ones trying to figure out how do we actually go about any level of regulation on the domestic and international issue. So I'm going to talk a little about engaging with two of these in particular. We're all reasonably familiar with uh, um, interaction in the outreach to the general public. So I'm going to spend a little less time on that. But I am going to note two areas where we've uh, um, really seen engagement from the general public um, on concerns around this. Next slide, please. So I'm here in um, New Zealand, for instance, and oh yeah, thanks. Um, so one thing I wanted to highlight from the community engagement workshops that have happened so far, particularly here, um, things like SATCON 2, is that all these different communities are in agreement on one point at the moment. The near Earth environment needs to be thought of as an environment. And that means we have a very different way of looking at this from something that might previously have been the case, 
we have a situation where the people who have been studying environments for a long time have a lot of advice for us and a lot of paths that have been well thought in the past and solutions that work for dealing with environments being modified by human activity, because we are in the era of the industrialization of the near-Earth environment. So how do we learn from their experience and how do we go and talk to them, right? This is yet another community we can engage with to actually find out how to deal with this very pressing issue actively. Uh, sorry, next, yeah, next slide, please. So one of the areas, um, so I'm going to talk briefly for a moment about the local context here. In the dark sky reserves um, in New Zealand, the general public are coming and asking about what are we going to do about the satellite constellations? Because in these areas, so, um, so this is Aoraki Mackenzie Dark Sky Reserve, the largest one in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And here people are starting to notice the satellite constellations, particularly the, um, the streaks as uh, Starlink puts onto orbit um, their string of pearls as the satellites actually start to move apart. Those are noticeable on a very regular basis. And it's important to remember here that it's the continual maintenance of this particular um, industrial activity that is going to be a constant pressing thing in public attention, not just the on-orbit constellation that is something that Ruben is dealing with on a very regular basis as well. So we have these pressing public concerns, but also potential ecological um, concerns that are going to be first visible in some of these environments where the light pollution levels are such uh, from human activity are already minimized. And so we can start to see potential um, ecological impacts from satellite constellations perhaps more clearly, but that's at a very early preliminary stage of the ecologists starting to get stuck into research there. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of broader cultural aspects, oh, back one, sorry. Um, in terms of broader cultural aspects, there are things like um, dawn and early morning activities that take place that are of significant cultural value. So here in Aotearoa, there is a, a um, event called Matariki, which is the Maori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, uh, the Maori New Year where you go and observe the satellite, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the star cluster um, known around the world uh, um, by many names. In New Zealand, it's Matariki. It's uh, known as the Pleiades uh, um, quite widely as well. And you observe this before dawn at its heliacal rising from the sun. So all across New Zealand, we have now thousands, if not tens of thousands of people coming out with their families before dawn to observe the pre-dawn sky at the point where satellite constellations are going to be at their most visible. So this is something where we have a cultural event where we are going to see a satellite constellation impact to some degree yet to be quantified. Next slide, please. In terms of how do we engage? So I'm going to finish up here by talking about how to have productive engagement with two of these communities that we're seeing. In terms of the aerospace uh, um, colleagues, uh, um, the level here is, this is not just one company. We've been talking a lot about, Star, uh, about Starlink and SpaceX today. But what we need to do here is have conversations with a broader community that is industry-wide because the only way that we're going to have a viable sky into the future is by having a shift in the way that the entire industry approaches the issue. Um, and this means talking to people who are engineers in the way that engineers understand, right? This is go and have conversations with your local aerospace groups, go and um, give little talks to your colleagues who teach how to um, build satellites, right? This is something where people have um, a whole bunch of training about how to create satellites. This needs to just start becoming part of best practice of this. Um, it is an engineering problem. We can lay it out as having an engineering scope and that there are goals that we want to achieve to it. And, uh, this is something where, as an engineering problem, 
it can have an engineering solution. It's not going to be easy, as you know, Tony has mentioned earlier, but it can have an engineering solution. And engineers love having problems to solve. So give it to them in that scope. Um, next point here. We want to try and identify what we can actually get their best practice to achieve. And I think they are reasonable people, right? Industry folks do not actually wish to destroy the night sky or the ability of Rupert Observatory to do things. So achieving that is important. And finally, if you talk to them, link them up with the industry working groups that uh, people like Connie and uh, the others have been organizing over the last while. We have large amounts of discussion taking place. Let's just keep the industry folks starting to talk to each other. This has been happening fast and the more we can have them talking to each other the better. Next slide please. In terms of the other community that we really do need to engage, uh, this is the policy makers. So but, um, Meredith I'm just going to get you to add all of the points here and I'll just keep talking through them. Here it's figuring out who in your government is the right person to talk to. And I'm speaking on this, uh, you know, in a more broad international context because we're an international community. We have many of us uh, uh, who engage with policymakers in different ways from, you know, if you're in a domestic context where you have an individual state through to uh, um, a domestic context where you're talking directly to perhaps your space agency or your economic development agency. And the thing I've found about doing this in the New Zealand context has been First, figure out who the right person is to, to talk to. Your research institute quite often will have someone whose job it is to figure out how to engage with government, like your research and innovation institute. They can help you find that person. Then have a conversation with that person and keep having that conversation. Go back every couple of weeks and go, so how's that going, getting on? Where's that work package got to? The persistence is quite key. And there's two aspects of this. One is, joining the dots for them on where do satellites fit in the economic plan. Their general aerospace is an economic activity. How do you tie this into what satellites are trying to achieve and what science is trying to achieve and making sure both of those are able to happen. And also pointing out to the policymakers that there are multiple international entities engaging on this. Show them there's these points of connection show them that they can actually uh, end up being part of a conversation where this country is doing something. Oh, that means we should get involved because we want to be um, engaging where those other two countries are also, that we do a lot of other stuff with are also engaging. And so for, um, the last point, please, Meredith. This is a big um, international effort. It's I think coming to a head at the UN uh, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPORS, and there is going to continue being dialogue there. It is now an actively tabled item for discussion and we need to keep that conversation happening. So thank you and uh, um, over to you Meredith for Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for kind of zooming us out and giving us a, a broader context to wrap up on. Um, I recognize that, uh, that unfortunately we are technically already a few minutes over time for this session. Everybody had so many wonderful and compelling things to say. Um, so I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen of nothing. And, uh, and just thank you all again for your time and attention to this important issue. Encourage you to please take a look at the Slack discussions happening um, uh, and you know, continue that over the course of the rest of the workshop. Um, I am always happy to be a person you reach out to. Um, if you have questions about kind of the anything related to satellite constellations, I've defined toes with lots of these different issues. And also the speakers today obviously have a lot of, uh, a lot of good resources for you as well. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all for your attention and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>